thank you everybody for showing up. This is our third Saturday seminar this season, um, and we're going to be doing several more. Um, stay plugged into our social media. It's not every week. The last week weather kind of canceled it, but uh, we'll keep people posted as we have different speakers coming in. But I'm really proud to announce uh, Paul Bunker this week. Uh, Paul is an old friend. We go back a ways. Um, in, through other way it means. Um, but Paul is an avid fisherman. He's been in the fishing industry. His second career was in the fishing industry. And now he's probably been the last 12, 13 years. He and his wife, Suzanne, in the back have been volunteering um, at Yellowstone um, and helping bring back the wild fishery that you know, has been played by some other influences. And so with that, I'm just proud to announce uh, Paul Bunker. Thank you very much, Dennis. Appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you about one of the passions in my wife and his life, and that's to go up to Yellowstone and uh, uh, help restore some of the native fish populations in the park. It's an ongoing uh, process and challenge, but we're making headway, and there are still opportunities for you guys to go up there and help. This presentation is going to be broken into two parts. One, I'm going to talk about what's happening in the lake, Yellowstone Lake, with the lake trout and the recovery of the cutthroats, and then I'll talk about 20 minutes on the volunteer uh, fly fishing program that was established in 2002. So, but first I want to do a little Alex Trebek type deal. Uh, top fish is the most popular fish in the park. Who, who can guess that? Okay, and you get a Yellowstone Science <laughs> magazine. Uh, the one in the lower right is probably, if you went to Joe Wright Reservoir, you probably catch some of those, but this was also a native to the park. Gray uh, Lane, you too have a Yellowstone Science. Everything you wanted to know what's happening in the park. And finally, on the far left, this guy is on the western part of the park, Specimen Creek, Gray Lane Creek, and again, it was one of the original fish that was in the park. Excuse me? Rainbow? Greenback. Nope, not a greenback. It is a, not a Colorado. All those things are bad. Oh, you've already got one, so do you have, do you have one for a friend? Give that one to a friend. It's the West Slope Cutthroat. Okay, a specific category of cutthroat that was uh, originally uh, established in the park. And what we're trying to do is bring those fish back. And so as I said, what we're going to first talk about is saving the Yellowstone cutthroat trout from the Yellowstone Lake. And that is pretty much the uh, picture of the Yellowstone Lake. It's right in the middle of the park. Uh, you can't really miss it. If you go south, east, uh, or even west, you'd have to travel over the given watershed. But it is an amazing place. It's a big freshwater lake. Uh, and what we're trying to do is keep more of the big guys by introducing a lot more of the smaller guys. And we, we, we talked, somebody said, said uh, they were back there in 1955 that they fished. Okay, this was at the turn of the century, 50 years ago. That wasn't you. But this is a typical picture of a Sunday outing on Yellowstone Lake. My grandfather in New Hampshire used to show me pictures of him sitting at a table with a hundred brookies or square tails about eight to ten, ten inches long. I don't know what he did with them all, but these guys are anywhere from 14 to 22. Very healthy, big Yellowstone cutthroat. 1962, did you stop at the fishing bridge? He might be one of those people. He might be one of those people, <laughs> right. And so exactly, uh, it used to be the spawning fish coming up Yellowstone, this is the fishing bridge, iconic, that the fish would come up into the lake during the springtime to spawn, and it was like the glory days of Deckers, where you could uh, see in that pool trout just stacked upon each other, and you, know, you could almost walk across them. In fact, in 1979, they realized that it wasn't such a good idea to actually catch fish off the bridge, so they closed it down. But up until that time, you could use whatever bait you wanted to catch spawning cutthroats. So in the old days, 1985, if this represented 20,000 Yellowstone cutthroats, each fish there, you're talking, you know, a couple million fish. 20 years later, it was reduced to this. You know, less than 10% of the population actually uh, was remaining in 2005. And the big reason was lake trout. I mean, it was 
Uh, they came in and all of a sudden they started just chowing down. And also drought and whirling disease. During low water years, and Yellowstone is just like Colorado, they don't have enough snow, they don't have enough water to come and fill in the creeks to, to create the spawning conditions for the uh, cutthroats to go up the creeks. And also whirling disease in the northern part of the, the lake around Pelican Creek, they found that they did have uh, uh, whirling disease, and so they've been battling that the same way that we've been battling here in Colorado. But the primary reason is the cutthroat, I mean the, the lake trout. They found out by taking some studies of the actual fish that they were introduced illegally in the mid-1980s. Unfortunately, it wasn't until the mid-90s that they had the first report given that a, yellow, uh, a, cup for, I mean, a lake trout was caught in the lake. When you go up to Yellowstone, you're going to get a little fat fishing angler's recording sheet. And they will ask you what day you fished, how long you fished, what kind of fish you caught. And it was because of one person turning in one of those slips that the fisheries office found out there was lake trout in the lake. So imagine 10 years for lake trout to just be unchecked, you know, just populating the lake. Uh, the genetic uh, test revealed that they were from Lewis Lake, which is down here. And this, the yellow line is the continental divide. So initially they felt that there was no way that the uh, lake trout could ha have a connection to Yellowstone Lake. But recently they found out that because of possible high water, lake trout could actually swim from Jackson Lake, which is south of the park, uh, through the creeks and into the lake. Possibility, but you know, right now they really don't care how they got there. It's what do we do now that they're there. So this is the historical uh, uh, lake trout population. Each year they do a survey in 1998, you can see how the population grew and exploded in the mid-2000s. And exactly in 2005, that was the reason why the cutthroats were down to less than 10%. And there's two classes. The purple line, purple bars are the adults, 3 to 17. They're capable of spawning. But then again, uh, the real problem now is the younger class. Those are less than two years. And so the, the park is trying to uh, uh, direct their attention to both classes, and we'll talk about what they're doing. Essentially, a mature cutthroat will consume anywhere from 36 to 40, uh, a mature lake trout will consume 36 to 40 young cutthroats a year. A uh, 30 inch lake trout can eat a 15 inch cutthroat. So, imagine an unchecked population just eating away. And unfortunately, the cutthroat that were in the lake provided uh, resources for a bunch of different animals that uh, inhabited the, the surrounding uh, parts of the lake. We're talking about otters, the bears, the grizzlies in the spring would come to the creeks and just you know feed themselves after the winter. The osprey, the eagles, uh, and the, the cutthroat really didn't have a predator, so they just continually grew and grew and grew. Once the lake trout were introduced, the cutthroat were primarily eaten, eat, eaten by the lake trout, and all of a sudden the birds, because the lake trout are beets water dwelling, uh, had no, no way of getting their natural food source. So uh, the scientists up there noticed that the osprey, for example, they only had about two nests uh, in 2005 surrounding the lake, and the lake is huge. And all of a sudden the elk, are being eaten by the, uh, by the bear because they no longer had the opportunity for the migrating uh, Yellowstone cutthroats coming up. And then the otters obviously had to resort to the uh, suckers. And when I talk suckers, it's not like the suckers you see here in Colorado that overtake Ontario. There's a couple of species uh, that are native to the lake, but they're very minor and they don't have really any implication on the population at all. So obviously, uh, the impact of the lake trout was tremendous. Uh, each spring, these guys, the, the uh, uh, rangers, will do a spring uh, hike up into the wilderness to find out about the grizzly bear activity. And on their way, they will take uh, a, a study of how many cutthroat that they see coming up the creeks uh, dur during the spawn. 
and as you can see, these are low water years, and then it, you know, a good year, and then all of a sudden it crashed in 2000. And so uh, the numbers of cutthroat were all of a sudden drastically declined. There was a guiding, a, a, a counting station near Clear Creek on the east side of the lake that had been monitoring this migration since 1945. Each spring, approximately 80,000 <coughs> cutthroats would come through that spawning station. 2006, there was less than 500. And so other creeks were uh, affected just as well. And these are the kind of adult cutthroats that come up by the spawning station. Very healthy fish. Sue, could you hit the down arrow for me? Oh, sorry. Is that yeah. fish on the bottom right taken out of Clear Creek? That's taken out of Clear Creek. Wow. I see what's happening. It's it escaped. not doing anything. It escaped. I can fish, but I can't anything. do a presentation. <laughs> No. There we go. How come so, did it for you? Because uh, there's another window came up. Just so let's, let's just see. So basically, what they decided is how to get rid of the lake trout. And the first uh, strategy was gill netting. My wife and I were actually on a gill boat, gill netting boat in 2009. Has anybody seen the Alaskan fish wars, where they throw out the nets catching the salmon? You know, they throw them out, and two hours later they go out and collect them. Well, uh, this is the uh, boat Freedom uh, that's owned by the park. And basically, they would set out their nets. Three days later, they would come by. And then they will, would haul up all the fish that were in the nets. And most of them, you know, uh, they're not alive, most of them. Some of them were cutthroat. If they were cutthroat, they would stop the operation and see if they were survived, or were uh, able to be reintroduced to the lake, and they put them back into the lake. And then they re would restart the operation. But the lake trout that they caught, their air bladders were cut so that they would sink down to the bottom, and they were basically dumped in back into the lake. And that was necessary to keep the balance of the chemistry uh, of the lake in check, because to remove all those lake trout, all of a sudden, you start not having all the, the uh, uh, byproducts of uh, the dead lake trout. So, <laughs> this is the historical data on the removal of lake trout by gill netting. In the early uh, late 1900s, 1990s, uh, it was less than 50,000 because we had one of those small park driven boats that we And then they realized in 2005. They weren't making any progress, and the cutthroat were still crashing. So what they decided to do was to hire contractors from the Midwest that were professional gill netters. They're called the Hickey Brothers. And they doubled their efforts through this time frame. So uh, now they're, each year, like in 2017, they removed 400,000 lake trout out of the lake. Wow. 400,000. So last year they removed. Do they do it only during the spawning? Okay. No. This is ice out to ice in. It's an operation that goes from the first mid May through mid October. How many boats do they have? Uh, three major boats. How many cutthroats do they get in there, too? Uh, when Sue and I did our deal, uh, we caught 780 lake trout and about 40 some odd cutthroat. About a thousand cutthroat. Yeah, so, and they're, and they're probably taking more cutthroat out because they're seeing signs that the lake trout population is beginning to crash as well. Because last year, they only removed 300,000 with the same amount of effort that they had used the year prior. So it, they're taking fewer out but having to spend more energy and time taking those fish out. So what the park is doing now is now that they try, they think they have a handle on the adults and the gill netting, how do, how do they control the younger class, the fish that are under two years old? So they came up with, uh, first we need to find out where the spawning beds were. 
Okay, seems like perfectly good sense. So what they did is they went to uh, different TU groups, and the TU groups could sponsor a Judas fish, where they would implant a transmitter, so that when the fish went to their spawning beds, they could find exactly where the key spawning beds were in the lake. And so that's where they targeted all the eggs and embryos, all the black dots that you see. Even though they were down here, it was a very sandy substrate, and it wasn't that typical rocky substrate that lake trout used to spawn. So their first idea, okay, how do we get the eggs out, off the bottom? Well, we'll dredge them out with a big, you know, suction, suction hose. You know, very difficult, very expensive. We'll shock them out. Folks from the University of Vermont uh, tried to, and they did a study where they covered the beds with, a, uh, with an array of electro uh, uh, wires and they ran, ran shock. But they found out because of the clarity of the water, the electro shock doesn't go very far from the actual uh, wires. So that wasn't uh, possible either. So then a couple years ago, they decided, well, let's see if we can cover them up with the carcasses of the dead lake trout. And in the lab, they found out that 100% of the eggs, almost 100% of the eggs and embryos were killed because what would happen is these fish decompose, it would suck out all the oxygen that the eggs and the embryos needed to survive. And so they think that they have a idea of how to get the eggs and the embryos. And the latest deal that they have is they, you know, it, it's difficult to store all the lake trout during the summer because the spawning is in the fall. So what they've come up with is these pellets based upon the, the actual composition material of the dead lake trout, uh, which is a big, uh, basically a soy, soybean meal, wheat flour, and some gluten. And these pellets are dropped on the spawning sites. Does the same thing <coughs> that the carcasses do. Uh, I talked with the uh, fisheries biologist last week. He said, I would love just to put the soy product down, but they don't sink as quickly as these things do. So that's, that's, that's the deal. And this is what it looks like after a couple of days of those pellets hitting the rocks. So they cover, they've done studies, you know, is it a light coverage, medium coverage? heavy coverage, extra heavy coverage, to determine what works best. And so what has happened in the last, since 2010? These are distribution charts from 2010 through 2016. Each year they do a study of, uh, in the same place, of cutthroat that come into the nets. And these are the sizes of the cutthroat that they catch. Uh, about 200 uh, millimeters is about an eight inch fish. When you're looking at 560 to 520, that's the, your 18 to 20 inch fish. So you can see in 2010, the population had very few young cutthroats being caught in the nets. But through the years, you can see that the younger fish classes have increased and these have been maintained. So they think they're making headway in killing off the young, uh, uh, or cutting off the eggs and the embryos and removing enough uh, lake trout to improve the uh, viability of, of the younger cuts. And you saw this chart before. Uh, in the latest surveys done by the rangers, they're also seeing more of those cutthroats coming up the creeks in their spring, uh, spring walks through the little sort of thing. So where do you think the percentage is now? You said it got as low as 10. They, they haven't had anything in the literature to, to, to make that, but they, they haven't made a guess. But they're seeing large quantities of smaller cutthroats coming into the lake. So going forward, uh, they're going to continue the gill netting because that's the only way that they're going to get the uh, older adults. But they're also going to focus their attention now on the eggs and embryos. And how can you help? Any questions first before we go on into the volunteer program? They feel that they have now controlled at least the lake trout population, or are they actually in a decline? Or do they, know? They, they are in a decline. If you saw that chart that depicted the young class and the older class, 
it, so they feel that they're beginning to make a difference. And you're saying they're, they're uh, more uh, uh, cutthroats migrating in the spring up to spawn? Very much so. Uh, how many of you saw the fly fishing film fest that was here in Evergreen a few months ago? There was a short video called The Return by a gentleman named Dave Sweet who uh, did a trip into the thoroughfare, which is in the southern part of the park. And uh, it, it's an amazing video. And, and I have the trailer, but I'd rather get through this and I'll play that later. But he is saying that the fishing there is fantastic. I gave this presentation two weeks ago to the Evergreen TU chapter. Uh, and a gentleman came up to me and says, you know, I went to the thoroughfare in the mid-1980s and just killed it. Went back there in the 1990s, killed it. 2000 went back, nothing. So it really showed the impact of the spawning uh, uh, Yellowstone country. Yes? Uh, is there any proof that uh, Mackinac were introduced illegally into Yellowstone Lake? Mackinac meaning well, the, lake trout? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, because of the DNA, they share the same DNA specifics or makeup as those in Lewis Lake. And I gave this presentation up in Boulder and a gentleman came up and says, I had a guiding trip with a guide out of Jackson, Wyoming. And after a few beers, he used to tell me stories about them taking bucket loads of lake trout and bringing them up to Yellowstone. Oh, boy. Well, one of the natives of West Yellowstone, his theory was they picked some of them up with the firefighting helicopter. And that's, that, that, that's another theory. And they got dumped in a stream or, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't really an induction. Mm -hmm. The Park Service planted for this fish in yes. this lake. And right. They didn't stay it, yeah, well, and there was a reason for that. And, that they introduced them into Shoshone and Lewis and Park uh, Lake and other places. Pretty good fishing. Yes, yeah. Good you know, if you're a lake trout fisherman, uh, it's great. <coughs> and there are people that send emails and have made lawsuits trying to stop the park from doing it. Uh, because, you know, it's a great lake trout fishery because they got plenty of food. So, you know. Any other questions? Okay. The Yellowstone Volunteer Fly Fishing Program. Uh, that's what my wife and I have been engaged in since 2006. And uh, it's just a bunch of folks, citizen scientists so-called, so uh, that come up to the park and help the park out control uh, fish uh, projects that the fisheries office wants us to do. As I said, it's established in 2002. Volunteers from around the country would come up to it. Uh, people from Pennsylvania, Texas, Florida, uh, New Hampshire, my other brother lives in New Hampshire. He turned me on to this project in 2006. What was nice about it was the program provided your entrance fee. You know, back then probably didn't make a difference, but nowadays when entrance fees are going up, yes it does. If you don't have that $10 Golden Eagle Pass, it's an expensive proposition to go to the National Park. Gave you a campsite, put a campsite. And it, at one time they actually had a research dorm that had two beds in it dedicated to the program. And that was cool because all the researchers from around the park that de dealt with seismology, uh, the vulc vulcanology, uh, the pikas, uh, any type of science, they were in this particular dormitory. And at night, we would sit around the table, and these are the people that you see on National Geographic and the Discovery Channel face to face. They're the ones that are on the programs, and you're talking to them what they did that day and how far the, you know, the, the, the Yellowstone was rising or declining, if the big one's going to happen next week, this week, <laughs> uh, so on and so forth. Transportation to and from the projects. It was nice. Volunteers only had to get to the park. They had to provide their gear. You had to buy a park license. Uh, if you have a Wyoming license or a Colorado license, that's not going to do you. You have to have a park license. And the food that you ate, and also your time and talent. I say talent because we're not looking for professional fishermen. We're looking for people that want to uh, be part of something bigger than themselves, trying to be that citizen science to, to really get involved in the conservation efforts. It's funded by the National Park Service. 
and Yellowstone Forever. Yellowstone Forever is our partner, and they are the uh, number one fundraising arm for the park. And so if you Google Yellowstone Forever, you'll see that the, the native fish population restoration is their number one project. So this is a, just a, a chart that, that, that shows the activity in the program. 2002 it started, the red line is the number of volunteers. The reason why it declined so much in 2011 is they shortened the program from mid-May to early September to early July to mid-September, just because of water conditions and the type of projects they were involved in. In the early stages in the green bar, those are the fish that the volunteers caught. So you see these in the early stages, there was a lot of projects that dealt with the removal of brook trout to find out exactly what was in these creeks as far as non-native fish. And then the hours uh, has pretty much stayed consistent. Uh, and so there's about, if you average it all out, there's about 60 volunteers per year and about 1,500 volunteer, volunteer hours, hours each year. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to negate what these guys did back in the turn of the century, the 20th century. Because the park at the time, when it first was established, was 40% fishless. And so to draw people to the park, they decided that they needed to stock rainbows, rookies, and browns, same way they did here in Colorado. But unfortunately, they didn't know what they were doing in terms of the impact on the original uh, fish, the cutthroats and the, the great ones. So what we're doing is trying to negate what they're doing. And here's a couple of studies that my wife and I have been involved in. This is in the middle of the park. It's the park, if you've been up to Yellowstone, there's an eight mile stretch between the mud pots and the falls where you can't, nobody can fish. Well, they wanted to find out what kind of fish were up in this creek called Trout Creek. And so, a group of us started out and hiked about four to five miles, and there was, you know, uh, skulls and carcasses along the way, and buffalo coming in and out of us. You know, it almost looked like Kevin Costner's movie coming up the beginning. And the kind of creeks that we actually fished in were very small, and all we were looking for is five to six inch uh, fingerlings, and we would give them to the coordinator. They would, you know, size them up, weigh them. Then they would clip their fins and take scale samples so they could do, the biologists, biologists could do genetic sampling. Pretty neat. For, that was our first trip and that got us. The next uh, projects we're involved in are up in the Gibbon River watershed. If you go up there for Grayling, you would probably go to Wolf Lake and uh, Grebe Lake and also the Gibbon. Uh, and so what they're trying to do is to determine uh, if some of those waters were indeed uh, suitable to the stock or whether they were dead. And one time we went out and we had to prove that Ice Lake didn't have any fish. So what we did is belly boated and we proved that there was no fish, at least for that one particular day, uh, that there was no fish in the lake. You know, sometimes the object is not to catch any fish. But that's okay. I mean, where else can you do that? and still enjoy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Another interesting project was to uh, mark the grayling to determine how far up the Gibbon River did they actually move. So basically, they would uh, identify where they were caught. The next year, they would catch the grayling again. If they caught one with a little mark of uh, paste behind their eye, they knew where those fish were caught. Or uh, and how far they migrated. So that was all part of the uh, reintroduction of, of the Great Line. And I just messed that up again. So another part, uh, another project was on the western part of the park where the project was to help restore the West Slope Cutthroat. And so, and this is the West Slope Cutthroat. And what we did, or what the park did initially, was to build these berms. And, there, and then we would go back and catch brook trout below the berms. 
and there's no pita pokes in here, correct? I hope. <laughs> because we would punch a hole in the tail of the brookies. So the falling we near, we would go up above this berm and catch brookies. And if we caught any brookies with a hole in their tail, or if they shot any brookies with a hole in the tail, they knew that this berm was not impenetrable, which was a problem. So they would have to go back to the drawing board because what they wanted to do was to establish a nice little habitat for these young West Slope cutthroats to grow and be uninhibited. And once they found that out, then they would rope down the uh, upper levels of the creeks to remove all the fish. And now what they're doing is they've restored the grayling and the West Slope cutthroats. So what is that again? That you just, it's, it's poison. This is poison. Okay. Broken. And they use it in Colorado extensively. Hmm. To get rid of you know suckers on the Cantero, you know they'll kill the entire lake to the uh, The last several years, we've been up in the northeast part of the park in the Lamar River watershed, and uh, we haven't caught as many fish, <coughs> but it's been a lot of fun because uh, the projects were pretty diverse. It was to determine the scope of the hybridization in the Soda Butte, Slough Creek, Lamar River, and Trout Lake. Again, if you've never been up to the park, those are four destinations where you should put on your list. Uh, in 2015, we caught 136 fish. Almost half were Yellowstone cutthroats. 31% was hybrids. And 19% were rainbows. In rainbows and cutthroats, they had the same spawning period. So they, and they really don't you know, dis, you know, distinguish between what's a cutthroat red and what's a rainbow red. So and that's, that's how hybrids are created. What are they doing they currently the, the park regulations in this part of the park they have to remove them. So if you catch a rainbow or a fish that is very definitely a hybrid, you can remove them, take them home to eat, throw them up in the bank, and let the birds take care of them. Uh, one of the easier projects was the removal of non-natives, so we would just go out fishing. And that was through the entire Lamar Valley watershed. So if we caught a brookie, so be it, in the woods it goes. Rainbows, same thing. But it was just a way to get ourselves introduced to that part of the park and also give the park some information. Hey, we just caught seven brookies up in the upper sort of watershed that had been treated the year before. So now they have to think about all the little feeder streams that go into the sort of view. And then we also did, and this was our last year that uh, we did this particular program, is the system telemetry studies. We had the most difficult piece of the whole project. We had to catch fish. <laughs> and, this, and this was on Slough Creek. And then we would treat those fish with a gentle bath of clove oil. And basically that's like giving yourselves a, a Jack Daniels bath in about 10 minutes. <laughs> you pretty much lays yourself out and you really don't care what's happening. So that's the same thing that happens for the cutthroat, but it's very quick. So the, this is a doctoral student from Montana State. He takes a picture, identifies the scope of hybridization, weighs them, so on and so forth, and then he prepares for surgery. And depending upon the size of the fish, they would put in this little pit tag, which is you know, a little bit bigger than a piece of rice, put it in the shoulder of the fish. An incision has to be made, but no stitches. And then the big things is the telemetry monitors, tags. And you saw those in the Judas fish, same principle was used. And so he would do that right on the, the, the banks of the river. And it took about five minutes total. After it was all done, the, uh, the fish was stitched up, put them in a, bag, a bucket of cold ice water right from the stream. They're back into the stream. And then along the Lamar watershed are all these scanning stations where they depict the movements of the fish. And that's what they're trying to do, is to establish where these fish, rainbows and cutthroats, spawn in the spring. And the MSU student actually flies in an airplane and has you know, one of those wands that you'll see people trying to track down you know, the uh, elk uh, collars. He does the same thing with these fish. So he's found out that they move uh, sometimes up to 30 miles. There was a couple of uh, tags that were up in uh, Eagle's Nest. Uh, um, you know, so they, they were 
They are unfortunate victims of a hungry bird. So that that station there would detect the RFIDs? Yes, the okay. movements of the bush. And some of them would have the actual serial number of... I didn't they can track it down. So, pretty interesting. So a typical day with the program. Starts off about 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, depending on where we went. This is Fishing Bridge. It was this particular year, there was a lot of fires around the park. But that's uh, morning. Uh, we'd get in a van. The coordinator would pick us up. We would load in our gear, our sandwiches, sit in the seat, and get taken to where we are going to work all day. Not bad work. Unfortunately, the morning buffalo jam at, uh, in the Hayden Valley. And then we also had Village Idiot Jams. Yeah. <laughs> you probably saw this, this guy last summer trying to play tag with the buffalo. Uh, he finally got his in the end. And then about 10 o'clock in the morning, we're off to fish uh, in the river. And this is the Lamar River, uh, as you uh, if you're familiar with the park. It's about a half a mile from the river. Mm -hmm. And then we have a PB&J Power Lunch. And if we were so chosen, we would have to dab the brookies in the afternoon. And this is how this guy used to dab the brookies. The creeks are so small and the vegetation is so intense that sometimes all you could do is put your fly over the vegetation and listen for the splash. <laughs> and if you're lucky enough, you came out with a fish or you had to go in and extract your cats. And then heading on the way back, this is the Loramar Valley. And uh, this is you know, the evening buffalo jam. This is our campsite where we would have evening buffalo jam. I slept in this tent. About 10.30 at night, we heard this And we had no idea what it could be. We had no bear spray. We had no hatchet. I mean, we would just you know, let the sun shine. And so basically, it was a nice place to spend the night and a great place to listen to the elk bugle in September. These guys would, you know, just mosey on through, not bother you unless you go right in front of them. And believe me, it's uh, when the tail is up, it's either charge or discharge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see one of those, get out of the way. So what status of the program currently? As I said, after the dorm was removed in 2017, we didn't have a program because that and also the coordinator had a well-deserved sabbatical up to Alaska. And in 2017, we tried to get volunteers, but we found out that the people from back east could not bring their camping gear uh, on the airplane, and so they walked to that. So we didn't have enough volunteers. This year, we had plenty of volunteers because in September, if you uh, are part of the TU online community, we sent out a little invitation and a description, and within three weeks, I had 125 hits of interest with over 150 people. So I, we had people lined up, but we still needed money because you all know that if the program is gone for two years in the government, the chances of a revival is slim to none. Well, this year it was slim and now it's none, but we're focusing on 2020, different, different strategies. The objective is to come up with $20,000 to fund two years of the operation getting a, uh, paying for the van, the gas, the nets, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, trying to come up with a slightly used RV fifth wheel uh, to house the coordinator, a slightly used vehicle to drive people around, and then hiring up a program coordinator. So if you have $20,000 in your checking account, you get a check with you, and then you get an RV, in a vehicle? <laughs> Come see me after the program. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, Yellowstone Forever is a great organization. If you give to conservation efforts, check those out. Because in this brochure, in the later parts of the program, or the article, there is an article called Where People Can Catch Trout and Trout Can Catch People. It's by Nate Schweber, who has written many books about fishing in Yellowstone. And it is indeed a place where it captures your, your passions. It has mine, it has Sue's. Uh, if it's on your bucket list, do it. Uh, and if you're interested in the program, my email is on that, that tag that you have. Uh, come join us.
And this was a picture taken on the Firehole River. I was oblivious to the big guy in the background. <laughs> oblivious until Bill, the coordinator, said, guess what you were fishing with? And I had no idea. And if you want more information, this Yellowstone Science, if you Google Yellowstone Science, there's a copy of this. It's a PDF, so it takes a little while to download, but you can read it at your leisure. It has everything to do from uh, history uh, to, you know, what was happening in 2017. Any questions on the volunteer program? Yeah. The program hasn't been uh, up and running for the last couple of years. For three years. For three years. Correct. We're yep. trying to react. Yes. Uh, yep. Uh, we, we gave it a, a, the good old college try this year. And on March 1st, you know, what really came up was six weeks of government shutdown. Five weeks. During January, which is planning season for the fishery. They were not allowed to you know, talk about their job. Uh, yeah, budget sure. cuts. You've seen what's happened to the National Park, yeah. Rocky Mountain. Uh, Yellowstone is no exception. <coughs> the uh, deferred maintenance list, if you want to look at the physical uh, update of their property, you know, they have over $500 million dollars of undone projects because they don't have one So uh, uh, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle, but it's a battle worth fighting. Because it, it's, it's, uh, it's just an amazing part of the world. And it's a day's drive. Yes. Yeah, when they came through West, uh, the Denver Fly Show, I met them. And, uh, they are a big proponent of the Yellowstone Show. Thank you. Do volunteers participate in the gill netting? And uh, they have an option to. It's something you'll do one time. Okay. Because it's, it's not the pleasant experience. It's trying to pull a three-day-old electron out of the building. We'll challenge the bravest of you. <laughs> Any other questions? Has Road Known been put in Lost Creek? What creek? Lost Creek. Uh, not, that, not that I know of. Not that I know of. But if you want more information or you're interested in the program, Send me an email and I will get you on the list and I will keep you informed of what's happening. Uh, you know, go, go into Yellowstone National Park website, look up fisheries, and you'll have all the information from past uh, fisheries report to what's going on there. So please do. Love to see you know, new, new people. Thanks so much. Thank you.